Good morning, everyone. It's great to join you for this second and final installment of our time with you this season. Um, all of us at World Vision would also like to echo the well wishes for the fathers in the congregation. So a very happy Father's Day to all of you. So, last Sunday, we learned in Isaiah how caring for the poor and upholding justice for the oppressed lie at the heart of God's loving and righteous character. We also saw how the missional witness of the church would be strengthened if we were to seek the work of God's word and spirit in our hearts so that our hearts would be broken with the things that break his heart and we would be spurred to show the same compassion to the vulnerable and afflicted, even if that comes at a sacrificial cost to ourselves. Now, whenever we embark on any effort to serve the poor, whether that be a one-off voluntary activity or a series of mission trips abroad, what we choose to do as part of that effort is consciously or otherwise informed by assumptions, assumptions about certain fundamental questions. Questions like, who are the poor? What is the nature of poverty? What are the best ways to help the poor? Today, we will see how the Bible speaks into these questions and how Scripture's answers should shape the church's approach to walking with the poor. So let's open with a word of prayer. Guide us, O Lord, by your word and your spirit, so that we may look upon a broken world with compassion as you do, and be stirred to play our role in your work of healing and renewal through Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Why did Jesus come to earth? How we respond to this question has consequences for our missional outreach to the poor. Most of us might say intuitively, Jesus came to die on the cross to save us from our sins. While this answer is true, the implications of this extend beyond our personal standing before God and the way we relate to him individually. Jesus' work on the cross is also God's solution for redeeming and renewing the whole of creation, which has also been broken by sin and death. There is, in fact, a Christmas carol that reminds us about this, See if you can recognize it. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow, far as the curse is found. As the writers Steve Corbett and Brian Fickett put it, the curse of sin is cosmic in scope, bringing decay, brokenness, and death to every corner of the universe. But as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, Jesus is making all things new. And one of the most familiar statements of this truth comes in Romans chapter 8. Paul writes that creation is subjected to frustration. It is suffering and groaning. But one day, all of creation will be, verse 21, liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. And what that means is that one day, God will raise us to resurrection life and the rest of creation will follow suit. Now, here's what's interesting. Paul describes this work of Jesus as reconciliation in our second scripture reading from Colossians chapter 1. So if we look at verse 19, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, in Christ, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. So Jesus isn't only the creator and the sustainer of all things, he is also the reconciler of everything. Now, what is it to reconcile? 
If two people are at odds with each other, to reconcile is for them to be put into right relationship with each other. So if Jesus came to earth to reconcile all that he created, that suggests that he came to restore foundational relationships that were broken when sin entered the world. Relationships that God intended as the building blocks for all of life. So for our first point, what are these relationships? Brian Myers, a member of faculty at Fuller Theological Seminary who previously served with World Vision, suggests that there are four relationships, and we see them played out in Genesis chapter 2. In the Garden of Eden, there is perfect harmony in all of these relationships, and this allows for life as it's meant to be. The chief relationship is that between God and human beings. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 28 to 30, and Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 to 19, we see God and human beings communing freely without any barriers between them. Man and woman are able to live in the presence of God and experience a joyful, intimate relationship with Him. And so there is harmony and intimacy in man's relationship with God. This is the fundamental harmony from which all other relationships fall into place. What are these relationships? There is our relationship with ourselves. In chapter 2, verse 7, we see that we have a creator. And what's extraordinary about our creation is found in chapter 1, verse 27. In the very act of creating us, God confers our unique identity as human beings, and we can securely answer the question, who are we? We are image bearers of God with dignity and worth inherent in our humanity. Now what follows from the question of identity is the question of purpose. What are our lives for? In chapter 1, verse 28, and chapter 2, verse 15, human beings are gifted with a role that confers purpose, direction, and meaning to our lives. God's world is full of resources, and he calls us to steward, harness, and cultivate them to make something fruitful of them for his glory. In this original vision for creation, work is a blessing. It is a context in which we can serve and worship God and also serve one another as the world is cultivated and shaped with the capacities and skills with which he equips us. Now, one key enabler of our ability to work is the next relationship, our relationship with the rest of creation. In chapter 1, verse 28 to 29, we see God blessing human beings with a world that cooperates with their benevolent dominion and cultivation. And creation is also fruitful and provides for them. Now, reciprocally, the expectation that human beings will be responsible and not exploitative in their use of the world's resources comes in chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And finally, we see that there is harmony in human beings' relationship with one another. In chapter 2, verses 18 to 23, with the creation of a woman from a rib of the man, human companionship emerges. And we see in verse 25 that Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. There is no barrier between them that prevents them from living in a loving relationship with one another. 
So we see in this biblical blueprint for human flourishing, and there appears to be a technical glitch, so let me read them out to you. We see in this biblical blueprint for human flourishing the four foundational relationships that God intended for humanity to experience fullness of life. Relationship with God, relationship with self, relationship with creation, and relationship with one another. Those are the four. But what happened after the fall? And that leads us to our second point. When Adam and Eve disobeyed God, all four of those relationships were broken. Their relationship with God was damaged as sin became a barrier and their intimacy with God was replaced with fear. Genesis chapter 3, verses 8 to 10. Their own sense of self was marred and their dignity was marred as well as their eyes were opened to their nakedness they developed a sense of shame and they were reduced to covering themselves hastily with loincloths. Genesis chapter 3, verse 7. Their relationship with each other was broken as Adam promptly and defensively blamed Eve for their sin. Chapter 3, verse 12. And finally, their relationship with the rest of creation became distorted as God cursed the ground and creation became antagonistic to mankind's efforts at cultivation, turning the fulfilling work of stewardship into the pain of labor, chapter 3, verses 17 to 19. The breakdown in these four relationships with God, with self, with other people and in life, with the result that many people down the ages have become disempowered from fulfilling their God-given capacities. What are these God-given capacities? It's to love and to be loved, to work and sustain themselves with the fruits of their work, and to live in peace and with dignity, free from want and from fear. One of the most heartbreaking aspects of our work at World Vision comes in discovering how the crippling effects of these broken relationships have destroyed the lives of children. This is Afsana, a young girl from Afghanistan, where World Vision has been serving vulnerable families for some 20 years. Afsana is a child bride, and she was married off at the age of 11. So we would like to share her story with you. Pishkashmarisunna <laughs> کو <laughs> پدر مادر خوب امی که نمیشه مادیت کردم بیاییم 
دختره خور خود درست نکنه مثلی از من تا چیز نکنه Afsana's story is unfortunately not isolated. The effects of these broken relationships have converged to erode the well-being and the future of many young girls like Afsana. The camp that you saw in the video was an informal settlement for internally displaced persons, people who were forcibly displaced from their homes to another part of their country unlike refugees who are driven across the border. One of the longest running causes of internal displacement in, Af in Afghanistan has been conflict. And this has been due to violence erupting over decades of civil war. But another lesser known cause has been climate change. Because of increasingly severe annual drought seasons, families reliant on agriculture or livestock farming have been forced to move from their homes in search of land for growing crops and pasture for their animals. Due to the extreme economic insecurity caused by these factors, families like Afsanas resort to child marriage as a negative coping mechanism to reduce the number of children they need to feed. Over several generations, this practice has sadly become normalized in parts of the country where families are forced to make decisions concerning the fate of their daughters that no family should be making. As a result, children like Afsana are not beloved, are not treated in ways that affirm their dignity and inherent worth. Instead, they are treated as less than human. Simply one more mouth to be bartered off to alleviate a household burden. Afsana's understanding of who she is has become marred. When people are made to believe that they do not have inherent worth or intelligence or capabilities or personhood or the right to have a voice, to contribute and to shape their living conditions and their future, they become disempowered and their lives are robbed of fruitfulness, purpose, and hope. And we see this tragically repeated in the experiences of many other children living in poverty who have been the casualties of discrimination, oppression, unjust systems, and hostile living conditions. We think of the young girl in Nepal who is anxious that menstruation has begun, because she knows that the traditional belief that her periods make her unclean will lead to her being confined by her family in an unhygienic hut, disrupting her education and excluding her from her friends and relatives. We think of the Rohingya child and his family struggling to eke out a living in Rakhine State, a child whose community has been poignantly described as the most friendless people in the world. We think of the child laborer in Bangladesh who is led to believe that his future doesn't matter, that his education can be foregone for manual toil, and whose voice is ignored if he complains of exploitation. And we think of the child in a slum in the Philippines whose makeshift shelter is damaged every year by typhoons, and who lives every night with the threat of being abducted by child traffickers. The crushing weight of humanity's broken relationships with God, with self, with other people, and with creation makes people poor and keeps them poor. Poverty is not only a physical problem, the lack of material things, but fundamentally a spiritual and relational problem. As Brian Myers puts it, poverty is a result of relationships that do not work, that are not just, that are not for life, that are not harmonious or enjoyable. Poverty is the absence of shalom in all its meanings, which include, though are not limited to, peace, harmony, 
well-being that are gifts from God, the sense that everything is as it should be, shalom. And Myers elaborates further, what causes this distortion and injustice in our relationships? What separates us within our community with some doing well and others suffering? What causes us to exclude and sometimes demonize the other? Why do we abuse the earth? Why does poverty entangle as it does? Why are the poor denied access to social power? What limits their sense of personal agency? It is because of deceptive and dominating relationships, because we are unable to love God and neighbor because of sin. We work for what we think life is for. We try to provide our own abundant life. Without a strong theology of sin, comprehensive explanations for poverty are hard to come by. But thanks be to God that that is not the end of the story. As we come to our last point, let's remember what Paul wrote in Colossians chapter 1. If we place our faith in Christ and his atoning work, we are justified by faith. In Christ, we are forgiven for our sins and declared righteous in the sight of God. What this means is that sin is no longer a barrier in our relationship with him. This is how God reconciles us to himself through Jesus and makes peace, restores harmony in our relationship with him. But let's not forget verse 20. He is seeking to reconcile, not just us, but to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven. So remember the lyric from Joy to the World with which we began? If the reach of the curse is cosmic in scope, so too is the reach of God's work of reconciliation in Christ. He has already begun to restore harmony to all the foundational relationships for human life. Now, of course, the fullness of the kingdom of God won't occur until Jesus returns. Only then will these relationships be fully healed and renewed, and all pain and suffering will be vanquished. But on that Sabbath day, in a synagogue in Nazareth some 2,000 years ago, when Jesus stood up and read from a scroll containing a messianic prophecy from Isaiah, Jesus clearly declared, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Luke chapter 4, verse 21. The rule of God over all creation, established through his Messiah in the new covenant, has already begun. And so as we await our king's return to fully consummate the blessings of his kingdom, the church has the privilege of participating in the advancement of his kingdom through missions. And perhaps it's now unsurprising that Paul describes the work of missions as the ministry of reconciliation in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So at verse 18, all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. If poverty is a result of broken relationships, then helping the poor involves moving them closer to living in right relationship with God, with self, with others, and the rest of creation. Any missional outreach to the poor, whether in Singapore or abroad, is a ministry of reconciliation. The experiences of children like Afsana show that sin dehumanizes, 
But when we reach out to the poor, we participate by the grace of the Holy Spirit in God's work of rehumanizing them, of loving and serving them in ways that move them back closer to God's original design and purpose for their lives, move them back closer to living out the fullness of their identity as God's image bearers. So we'd like to share with you just one example of what this can look like when a church embraces its identity as a family of Christ's ambassadors and serves as an engine of this ministry of reconciliation in a poor community. So this is the story of a community in Rwanda where World Vision has partnered with the local church to implement community development programs that address not only their physical needs, but also their spiritual nurture. Nifuje <laughs> Ufasha kominote ndi mugu mugu hano. Inza muri kominote na sanzari kominote igri nyuma chane mumnyu vire. Wo abana ba abaje ibarwa zaga baga kikubwe rako biruwa gamu mire mama na na wapa kirwa na mano ba fite wakubare. Kanda batara na fita numu choko ya teka, bila tumarero, hazi nguara nyeshi, zinzoka, zinzoka munda, haba nabara zi nguara kachana, bila tumaba na gilani miride bibi. Uwo, haba nabara, haba bja ibarwa za mga aki, kube rako, mbili kwa gamu mire, haba nanawa wakiru, wanda hama nduwa fite, woku wale. Maze no kubona ibibazo kominote ifite namenye ko hano hanakorera na wa division byatumye nabo babashije kudufasha baza kutufasha gukemura ibibazo byari bihari muri kominote The church is an indispensable partner and we believe that the church is ordained by God to be able to bring holistic change within the communities Poverty is in many ways more than just a lack of physical or material needs. It is also a mindset issue. The Empowered Worldview is, is a training that is used by World Vision to engage communities on mindset change and behavior change. Because the Chane, who Fatani Nawa Division, Baram Hugu Yokure, Hinduka Uijire. bana nta byiza byacyo gifite ariko hanyigishirije anyereka ibyiza byacyo ambira ko ari cya umuntu azaraga umwuzu kuri umwuzu kuruza kazakiryaho kikamufasha kurera abana be neza bakabona amafaranga yifuye because of the mindset change they see that actually they have so many god given resources and they are not condemned to a state of poverty wegere wa division tumaze kuyegera turaganira tubere ku bushobozi dufite wubatse ukarangiza ibindi bikoresho byose byubatse kuri ya shuri wa division irabituka ariko kubera ko irerero ryaje aho bajyanye baba bafite umutekano uyu tashye usanga abana babo bariye neza nta kibazo hano wabahohotera kubera ko baba bafite ubuzima bari kubabunga bungirizi Iyo baje hariya ki nababyeyi babo kujya bagirira iki abana isoko 
Jesus, we go over the road. We are in the Kujihen. We are in the Raburika. Yego. Turi hano. We have got Makamazi. Mavi. We are standing at the same rugo. We are not going to be angry. We are in the Zoka. Abatera Munga. Mubi Kolga Bakora. Badu Fasha Mugushe Jichirabana. Jewe chuo bate chere zao ni chinge chi, bate chere zao kwara wano, bimhoe nishi, nuru kundo rwishi, vitu ma bate chere zako kwa ana. We see there is a spiritual transformation within the community, especially through the church, where the children and the, the communities also, they get a better understanding of what it means to follow the Lord Jesus. And we see that the numbers of the church have been growing in very big ways. We thank God for the transformation of so many vulnerable lives in this community through the local church. What's the lesson for us? What their experience attests to is that for the church, walking with the poor toward fullness of life is necessarily a long-term sacrificial journey, as it can take years to help people to overcome their problems. If poverty is rooted in broken relationships, then highly relational approaches, connecting with people, are needed to share the grace and love of God with the poor to help them heal from their brokenness. If you chose to be chosen last week, or if you've been a child sponsor for many years, this is the kind of relational ministry that you are supporting and participating in as you exchange letters with them and travel with us to the field to meet with them, you are journeying with your sponsored children and their families as they grow to fulfill their God-given potential through long-term programs run by our field workers that holistically address both the physical and spiritual root causes of poverty. You see, the clearest precedent that we have of the impact of committing to that long-term journey with the poor and afflicted comes from Jesus himself. As Paul writes in Romans chapter 5, you see at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. And in verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And again in verse 10, for if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Paul's words remind us that fundamentally, we are no different from, and certainly not superior to, the people whom we seek to serve in our missional work. For all have sinned and fall short, of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. The four foundational relationships with God, with self, with other people, and with creation are broken in our lives too. Yet God came into the world to redeem us through Christ and continues to journey with us in the difficult process of our own transformation through his Holy Spirit who lives within us. There are plenty of ups and downs in our relationship with God too, but He is unchanging in His steadfast love and covenantal faithfulness. He sticks it out with us so that we may continue to be sanctified, to be rehumanized and brought back closer to living fully as His image bearers. 
the challenge for us in the church then is whether we can extend that same gift of sacrificial grace and patience and love to the people whom we serve, people who are broken, just like us, so that they too may rediscover, embrace, and harness their God-given capabilities to work, to create, to build relationships, to love generously, to fully realize their potential and humanity, and to have their eyes opened to their identity as God's image bearers. The ultimate hope, of course, is that the sincerity and dedication of our spirit-led witness as we walk with the poor may prompt the question to which Jesus is the answer, so that they too may experience Jesus' gift of life in all its fullness. Let's close with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for how your Son came to make all things new, to break the hold of sin and death far as the curse is found. Thank you for how through his sacrifice on the cross he has reconciled us to you and begun the work of healing our broken relationships with one another, with creation, and with ourselves. Please guide us and embolden us with your love and wisdom to play our part in your reconciling work in this world and in walking with the poor toward fullness of life in you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.